Uh, for my perspective, I was a fellow at the Stedman Clinic some time ago, learned under Stedman and LaProd. You know, Stedman taught us at that time about the healing response. LaProd told us to reconstruct everything that we saw. And then for the past five years, I've been hanging out with this guy. And this guy does a lot regarding repair and thinks forward and a lot about biology as well. So that's my perspective. I do have some disclosures that I do work with Arthrex on a, a, on a, a research level and so I have some other research support. Also, to explain my crutches, I recently, 10 days ago, had a hip scope. So that explains the elephant in the room behind me. And uh, I stayed awake the whole time, and it was a lot of fun. So let's get started talking about the ALL. As an outline, that's a lot to cover in 10 minutes. So I'm going to talk about the ALL a little bit more than multi-ligament knee injury. I know it's football season, so we are going to see a lot of these, or we're going to see some of these with football, and let's not freak out about them, and we'll hit some 30,000-foot views about them. But in terms of the ALL, it's a controversial emerging topic, but I'd submit to you that it's actually been developing for longer than we think. And just like this emerging controversial topic, I was extremely skeptical at first, but now I'm extremely interested in trying to balance out the hype from the truth and the facts. So that's what we're going to go through and talk about right now. The history of it all begins with this guy. This is Paul Sagand. And in 1879, he wrote his manuscript and really coined the term the Sagand fracture. And from there, we thought that this was synonymous with ACL injury, and we started looking at this and thinking about this as anterior lateral instability as early as then. It was really Houston and Andrews, and who in 1976 wrote a manuscript about anterior lateral rotatory instability that they coined together this concept and helped us bring it to the modern day. Then if we look at the narrative, and I say narrative in terms of history, over the past 40 years, it helps us understand how we ended up where we are. And narrative, I think, is a better way to say than history, because the history of it is we've been studying it for some time, but the narrative has been pushed by what we've been doing clinically and practically. So in the 70s, it was lateroplasty plus an ACL repair. Andrews published about it in 1983 in CORE. He also, in 1985, started thinking about he would try and get two bundles with his lateral tenodesis, in his mind, trying to construct a double bundle style of a tenodesis laterally. Then in the 80s, we started thinking about arthroscopic ACL reconstruction. So that's where our narrative went and where it focused. And then in the 90s, Freddie Fu and the thoughts about double bundle helped push us towards where we we're headed with anatomic ACL reconstruction. So we think about our narrative, it's really helped us think, but the whole time we're learning about the same concepts and developing the same concepts as well. And I believe that this decade that we're in right now is the decade of the ALL, or more importantly, the lateral complex that's over there, all balancing together that may be the missing piece in what we're doing with reconstruction. So that's a little bit of the history, and we may be going a little bit back to the future in terms of what we are doing. The science. Now, the science, we all think about Clace, and, we all, and, and appropriately so, he helped us bring this to the forefront. But when you really think about how long we've been developing this concept, it's been quite some time. And all his cadaveric, cadaveric studies are what have caught our attention recently, and his anatomic in 2013 helped us. We look at the systematic review of it, and it's been developing for longer than that. This is from his chapter after he wrote his, histology, his anatomic study. And you notice how he was studying it. They serially first sectioned the ALL, followed by the posterior lateral bundle, followed by the anterior medial bundle. So at that time when we, he presented this, and I first remember seeing this at OTFL about three years ago, I wasn't quite buying it at that time. About that time, Al Gatgood and his group did a systematic review of our understandings of these lateral tissues. And here's that systematic review and fast forward. There are a lot of studies out there that have been studying this ever since 1976. Three pages worth if you read that manuscript. And some highlights are that there's 19 studies from 1976 to 2014 that have looked at the lateral complex. Seven have been laboratory studies, eight mixed lab and clinical studies, three imaging studies, one clinical observational study. So it's something that we've been building. It seems that we're all beating around the bush with semantics in terms of these studies. We're all talking about the same thing, but thinking about it and talking about it a little bit differently whether it be the mid-third capsular ligament, the lateral capsule, the anterior slip, the capsulo-osseous layer, all these names are really just beating around the bush for the same complex of structures. 
The ALL is a real structure is the bottom line or the lateral complex and it can be identified in 96% of all knees. The anatomy itself, this is from Laprade's study recently. We think the area of the femoral insertion is about 70 millimeters and the tibial insertion is about 65 millimeters for the ALL. His studies also showed us in terms of where, similar in the Laprade fashion, where is the vector focused it's 2.7 millimeters proximal to the FCL and 2.8 millimeters posterior. The tibial is about halfway between Gerdes and the anterior fibula and distal to the joint by 9.5 millimeters. We did a study where we were looking at how it correlates with the biceps femoris. And what we found is that trying to tease out the ALL from the tibial band of the biceps femoris from the IT band insertion is very difficult. And that has led us to the insertion and the understanding that it's more a confluence of structures all coming together at that one point. In terms of a very reproducible anatomic landmark that I typically use is what I call the lateral champagne drop-off. If you put your thumb right at that one spot where the musculature is coming up and you can feel that going towards the joint the other side, it's a very reproducible spot in my hands. The simple biomechanics, the failure load when you pull it to failure is 175 newtons on average. Its stiffness is 20 newtons over millimeters, and a Sagan fracture occurred in 30%. Complex biomechanics, I think, is where we get a better understanding of what's going on here anterior laterally. Does it really do anything? This is a study from 2016, AJSM, looking at the complex biomechanics of this whole lateral complex. Kittle and his group determined they felt that it was elements of the IT band that were more important for anterior lateral stability than the ALL itself. So they said, no, the ALL does not do anything. Laprade and his group later studied it with the Veil robot, looking at the same concept. First, checking ACL deficient knees, followed by ALL deficient knees, and found a much greater contribution of the ALL in their conclusion. So they said, yes. So who's right with these two opposing views? Now, I'd submit to you that when you look at the methods section, and that was one thing we joked about earlier today, we sometimes skim over the methods when you really dig down the methods section of these two studies, I'd submit to you that they're both right, and here's why. This is Kittle's dissection. Kittle would take the big IT band down, and then the very fine line between where's IT band stop and where does ALL start was very vague and ambiguous. And so components that he really harps on about being the deep layer of the IT band, I think other people discuss as the actual ALL itself and think of these things more like trees instead of vectors and ropes is probably will give us a better understanding of how they actual function. So if you look at his dissections and his determination, see how that all spreads out there where I've circled there. It all confludes together or comes together at that spot. Similarly, if you look at Laprade's methods when they did their robot study, here's how they actual created the ALL disruption. They made a one centimeter disruption right there. And he just told us that the footprint was only 70 millimeters in area. So he made a bigger disruption than the ALL's footprint alone. So I think he disrupted the ALL, but he also disrupted the deep IT band layer and probably some of biceps femoris as well. So I think we need to think of this more as an intimate confluence of the IT band, the biceps femoris, and the ALL all coming together like the roots of a tree in one location. So in terms of technique, this is something I won't go over too, too much because I, there's many resources on the website in terms of arthritis where you can find technique out. A couple of pointers is to always think about how you're aiming on the femoral just so you don't converge with your femoral tunnel of your ACL. Biomechanically, these reconstructions have performed well. This is from the Veil robot showing the ACL with ALL reconstruction reestablished the normal kinematics in terms of anterior lateral instability. One thing that they conclude is that you should tension at 30 degrees and you can over constrain and for that reason I, I recommend that you use collagen instead of any other synthetic fibers laterally. Clinically there's three studies out there to guide us in the literature and they've all shown us good return to play in terms of outcomes and there's been some comparative studies that make us think that this is the way to go. Surgical indications depend upon who you ask. Sonia Cartier recommends it in anybody with a grade 2 or grade 3 pivot when you've got a Sagan fracture, anytime you've got a chronic ACL injury, or high-level athletes. In terms of the biomechanical comparison, I think this is our next step. Our next steps are to take these procedures and compare them biomechanically 
We also should keep an eye on our get good study that he presented preliminary evidence for in Issacos showing better outcomes with the addition of a lateral tenodesis to ACL reconstructions. Here's a case example for you quickly, a 22-year-old who is about to start his senior year at a Division II. Three years out from a BTB ACL reconstruction, and he's always told me that he couldn't cut right, and he has a bucket meniscus at the same time. This guy's four months from being able to perform so that he can finish his senior year because he would like to try and get a pro contract. So we did a meniscus inside-out repair. When we looked at his graft, it was 85% intact, so we microfractured the notch. And then we added an ALL laterally to help assist what was happening inside with his ACL. He was able to return for his senior year and perform the whole senior year after our, ACL, our ALL reconstruction and meniscus repair. And he said to me, now I can cut both ways. The trainers noticed that before we, I had this done, I was always cutting to the right. So there may be something to what we can do laterally. But in terms of when I use it, I'm still very skeptical and still choosing wisely. Patients with failed ACL reconstructions who have increased bite and signs, as this patient right here, you can see his increased external or his increased recurvatum. Briefly, multi-ligament knee, keep your head. We all know to ensure neurovascular integrity and have a low threshold to admit these patients to the hospital. Secondary assessment, consider long leg views. Use stress x-rays to augment what you do with your MRIs. Operative interventions, don't be afraid to use a two-stage if you need to but we do prefer a single stage. PCL repair is a good option. Don't throw it out. PCL reconstruction is usually our go-to. The Laprod Le technique's been around and have been invalidated. The Levy all, in, all Inside is another technique that I've moved to. And then we've also taken this to the next level to think about an All Inside double bundle. And the real advantage to this is that you can, you can tension the bundles independently at 90 degrees and 30 degrees. So it's quite something that's, that helps you in terms of that pseudo Lockman versus the posterior drawer. The collaterals, don't give up on repair. I know a lot of times we think reconstruct everything was what I learned in my fellowship, but I do think there is a role for repair. The Laprade versus the Larson. Laprade has been well developed, but the Larson is my go-to when there's been any sort of posterior vascular surgery because I don't want to do that large posterior dissection. Minimally invasive internal splint I'm still observing, and we're using it sometimes to augment our repairs. So that was a lot to cover in just 10 minutes. In conclusion, I'm enjoying the debate about the ALL, and it's fun to see from the sidelines. I consider it a good tool in the toolbox, but not everything is a nail. For multimedial ligament knees, always keep your head. There are multiple ways to get the job done. There's just not one way to do it. And keep multiple tools in your toolbox. Thanks to Tim and everyone at Arthrex for the invitation, and sorry it was a little bit fast.